ಭಂಜನಂ ನಿತ್ಯಂ ಅನಂತರೂಪ ಭಕ್ತಾಧೃತವಿಗ್ರಹ ವೈ ಈಶಾವತಾರ ಪರಮೇಶಮಿಡ್ಯ ತಂ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಶಿರಸ ನಮ ಜನನಿ ಸಾರದಾಂದೇವಿ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಪಾದಪದ್ಮೀತೃತ್ವಾ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಮುಹೂರ್ಮುಹು ನಮಸ್ತಿರಾಜಾಯ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದಸೂರೈ ಸಚ್ಚಿದ್ ಸುಖಸ್ವರೂಪಾಯ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನೇತಾಪಹಾರಿಣಿ ಸೊ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ವಿತ್ ಅವರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕರ್ಮ ಯೋಗ ದ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಫೈವ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ಮ ಯೋಗ ವಿಚ್ ವಿ ವೇರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ we help ourselves not the world so the portion uh, which we have studied last class we will continue from the portion following that it's in the page 75 here so yet we must do good the desire to do good is the highest motive power we have if we know all the time that it is a privilege to help others so it's a privilege to help others why it's a privilege <clears throat> because that's how we get the opportunity to efface our ego so it's an opportunity as swami vivekananda again and again is saying that this world is a gymnasium where we have came to make ourselves strong so each and every scope to help others is an opportunity of self effacement so it's a privilege to help others this concept is very nicely depicted in the life of goodwin that as we were discussing previously also that goodwin the disciple of swami vivekananda he came with swami ji when swami ji returned to india the way he came in contact with swami ji was that he used to take the short hand of swami vivekananda's lecture in the west as you all know most of the lectures of swami vivekananda was extempore so it was the need for recording those valuable lectures so his disciples in the west they appointed goodwin to take the short hand notes of swami vivekananda's lecture and in the process of taking the short hand notes he became devoted to swami ji and he became so much devoted that he came to india he started serving swami ji but in a, in no short time it was discovered that he is taking remuneration from swami vivekananda and like a rumor it spread that he is as such not a disciple he is a paid worker when this word reached the ears of goodwin he immediately told what he told was very significant that yes it's true that i take some remuneration from swami vivekananda but it's not because of for me i have an old mother say back in uk just for her sustenance i get some remuneration from swami ji to send that money to her but no one think no one should think that it is because for that remuneration i serve swami ji the love for swami ji the reverence for swami ji is from the bottom of my heart so that's how we should work in our day to day life that we are all being positioned in life as per responsibility to do various duties we are in certain professions but let us not have that mercenary attitude that this is what i get this is what my position and this is what i get in return this is the thing i calculate and give if we take it that it is a privilege that whatever work we are doing it's a privilege that there are so many people 
who are most probably as capable as me, but somehow the destiny has favored me, the luck has favored me, and I am here to take the responsibilities which others could have also have taken. And so it's a privilege, it's an opportunity to grow by serving others. So it's not that if we just change the attitude, we need not have to think of uh, changing the work pattern. So we need not have to think of uh, the changing the work pattern. What we have to do is just to change our attitude. The moment we change our attitude, the moment we change our paradigm, the way we think, the same work becomes karma yoga. That it is out of service I am doing, whatever remuneration I get, whatever salary I get, it is there just for my sustenance, for my family's sustenance. I, but I never equate with that, with the job which I am doing. I know the job which I am doing is after all, in some way or other, for the benefit of the humankind. There's no work which as such is not for the benefit of the humankind. All the professions, all the works which we are doing directly or indirectly is linked to the benefit of the humankind. And I do with that attitude that my part I am playing. That in this whole picture, it's not that I can change the world and I can do something very big, but I am doing my part in this huge group activity, I am just doing my role. And that way I am contributing. And it's a privilege on me that I have got this scope. So with that type of reverential attitude, we should work. That's what Swamiji is indicating when he's saying that it's a privilege to help others. Do not stand on a high pedestal and take five cents in your hand and say, hear my poor man, but be grateful that the poor man is there so that making a gift to him, you are able to help yourself. It is not the receiver that is blessed, but it is the giver. Be thankful that you are allowed to exercise your power of benevolence and mercy in the world and thus become pure and perfect. So that's the thing which Swamiji is saying that we thankful that you are allowed to exercise your power of benevolence and mercy in the world. As Swamiji again and again says that this world is a great gymnasium where we work out, but what we work out when we work out is for the effacement of the ego. So it's an opportunity. So I got that scope to efface my ego by relating to the other's needs, to the other's uh, wants and giving the other the primary importance, not me. So that way we grow, we start growing spiritually and it's a scope given to us. So that's why be thankful that you are allowed to exercise your power of benevolence and mercy in the world and thus become pure and perfect. All good acts tend to make us pure and perfect. What can we do at the best? So now Swamiji is saying that in our attempt to do good to the world, there are so many hindrances some hindrances are because of our inherent selfishness. So as we have not cleansed ourselves properly, our psyche hasn't been cleaned, there is no chitta shuddhi. Suddenly, uh, most of our social uh, engagements, occupations, the so-called our reaching out to help others, if we really judge, we will find that as I cannot sit quietly, I need some engagement. And this is something which is applauded, which is approved, I move out. But I haven't gone through sufficient chitta shuddhi. The selfishness is there. As long as I haven't cleansed myself, if I go out to help others, what can be the result? What Swamiji will be saying now is something which we will find even today is something which is rampant in the present society. In the name of service, what we do. So Swamiji is saying, you, will, you can find these words is actually 
something which can relate to even at present. All good acts tend to make us pure and perfect. What can we do at best? So now Swamiji is just relating to that fact that if with, without purity, without purifying ourselves, if we move out to help others, what is the result? Build a hospital, make roads or erect charity asylums. We can organize a charity and collect two or three millions of dollars. Build a hospital with one million. With a second, give balls and drink champagne. And of the third, let the officers steal half and leave the rest finally to reach the poor. So throughout the world, we will find <clears throat> everywhere. We did not name organizations, even international organizations, the so-called organizations which are meant for charity. Those who are working there, the salary sometimes is even higher than the so-called CEOs in some multinational companies. It has been found, it has been revealed. So it all goes in the name of charity at last you will find it all goes to the one who are involved to reach out. The one to whom I'm reaching out at last goes a very meager amount. Rest all is shared by the entire the institution, by the instant institution which is there to serve the needy. And it's something which has even came out recently it's always there in the news, in the media. If you just are aware of it, you will find that this news is something very common. At Swami Vivekananda in the West, when he was there, very nicely he observed the way that all the organizations are working. And what he told is something very, very important. He was thinking whether to form an organization in the name of Ramakrishna or not organization in the name of Ramakrishna was yet to be formed. So Sri Ram, Swami Vivekananda was just giving thought in those regards. And later he is recollecting that what his process of thought was. He told the first idea which came to my mind that I shouldn't form an organization. Why? Because each and every organization, what is the biggest defect? Because he's, now he's saying the biggest defect is I found by studying all the organization is they're all very low efficiency engine. They take a lot, lot of fuel is required, but the output is minimal. It's a very low efficiency engine, the so-called charitable organizations. The output is very less, the fuel, they have to give a lot of fuel. And then, of course, he gave a second thought for a different reason. He told that this uh, sublime ideas of Ramakrishna, profound ideas of Ramakrishna, which is going to revol revolutionize the thought process of the entire world, it may take time. Because we as the world, we as a whole, as a world have to evolve to really relate to the words of the prophet Ramakrishna. It may take time, but these words are something which are going to play a great revolution in the thought process of the entire humankind. So these ideas should be preserved. And unless an organization is there, it becomes almost impossible to preserve those ideas. So organization is needed. So sometimes Swamiji is using the word necessary evil. So it becomes a necessary evil because as the mind of all involved there is not properly cleansed, the selfishness has not vanished. You will find that in the name of charity at last, it is our self-interest that gets the priority. So that's why Swamiji is saying that we may organize a charity and collect two or three millions of dollars, build a hospital with one million, with the second, give balls and drink champagne. And of the third, let the officers steal half and leave the rest finally to reach the poor. But what are all these? So now this is the hindrance which is of adhyatmic nature because of our own inherent uh, deficiencies, because of our inherent selfishness. But there is some 
adi daivik adi bhautik hindrances that also he is saying that what he is indicating one mighty wind in 5 minutes can break all your buildings up what shall we do then one volcanic eruption may sweep away all our roads and hospitals and cities and buildings so all the work we do is something so uh, <clears throat> vulnerable to even the changes which is going on constantly in this world everything can be washed out in no minutes and that happens nature has its own ways then why should we help so let us give up all this foolish talk of doing good to the world it is not waiting for you or my help yet we must work and constantly do good because it is a blessing to ourselves so so let us give up this all that uh, that no beggar whom we have helped has become perfect no beggar whom we have helped has become perfect no beggar whom we have helped has ever owed a single cent to us we owe everything to him because he has allowed us to exercise our charity to him it is entirely wrong to think that we have done or can do good to the world or to think that we have helped such and such people it is a foolish thought that all such that all it is a foolish thought and all foolish thought bring misery we think that we have helped some man and expect him to thank us and because he does not unhappiness comes to us <clears throat> so this is the thing we will find that at last that the the least amount of expectation which we have sometimes we say i expect nothing it's a very common adage which we use i expect nothing but at least he should be thankful i have helped such and such person so much he never even shows that he is thankful to me no sense of gratitude so that's the last hindrance we should be aware of that that even to expect that gratitude from others to expect gratitude from the other is also an expectation so no shorts of expectation should be there very nice example is there in the life of holy mother that even when we do acts of charity there is expectation what's the expectation okay i don't expect from the person whom i am helping but most probably in my mind i have the idea after all god is saying me god will be favorable towards me even that also is expectation it's very difficult to understand karma yoga that's why shankaracharya in bhagavad gita in the commentary when he's commenting on nishkama karma very specifically is indi- indicating what ishwaropi me tushyantu iti sangam tyaktwa that even the lord will be pleased with me i don't want the uh, gratitude of the world but at least worst lord should be pleased with me even that sangha that attachment you should renounce that's the real karma yoga that no i just there is no tags attached to what i do and i don't even want that the lord should bless me for that because there also the ego comes into picture there's a nice incident in the life of holy mother when she used to stay in calcutta at udbodhan the Gang, the river ganges was very nearby so it was her daily routine she used to go to the ganges to have a dip there so it was something like ritual she will go have a dip in the ganges and while returning she will find that there are many beggars sitting by the bank uh, by the side of the road and she used to take some fruits and very like a very uh, you know that she had some child like nature while offering the fruits to the beggars she will say that fall thou follow tomake dilam very interesting that in bengali it's a pun fall there were fall means the fruit is called the fall and again the result of action is also fall so the 
results, the good merits that I accrue by giving you this fruit, that also I give it to you. So fall, dawar, follow, amita ma ke So that's the real karma yoga. So we should always remember that as it is in this paragraph, as we have, we have just seen that what is mentioned, let us give up all foolish talk of doing good to the world. It is not waiting for your or my help. These eight sentences, sometimes we read casually, but it is such a significant sentence that it is not waiting for your or my help. Especially at the time of COVID-19 pandemic, it, you will find that we thought that we are the one who had the deciding factor of nature. That's what we were thinking that we have progressed so much that we, it is as a humankind, we are the master even of the nature, we can manipulate. And now for COVID-19, for one year, when we have almost been encaged, we find the world is going on. The animal kingdom is unaffected. The nature is actually replenishing. It has its own way to cleanse itself and it doesn't need the human being. We are not something without which the nature can, won't be there. It continues. If we are there to cooperate well and good, otherwise nature in the process of cleansing itself can even cleanse us. We are that it is not waiting for your or my help. It sustains itself. We can never be the masters of nature and dictate nature. So that's the humble attitude which we should need. We should always have. That we are working, we are trying to do good because it is a blessing to ourselves. That it is only the way we can become perfect. No beggar whom we have helped has ever owed a single cent to us. We owe everything to him because he has allowed us to exercise our charity on him. It is entirely wrong to think that we have done or can do good to the world or to think that we have helped such and such people. It is a foolish thought and all foolish thoughts bring misery. We think that we have helped some man and expect him to thank us and because he does not, unhappiness comes to us. So that least expectation at which we were speaking of, that even that the other person should be having a sense of gratitude towards me, that also shouldn't be there. Once I have acted, there it's over. As is a common adage, says common way of saying that if any right hand is giving, is giving away something, your left hand shouldn't know. Do it silently. I still remember, I was in the Northeast India, Naruttam Nagar, Arunachal Pradesh for quite a few years there we run school for the tribals and the tribal the tri the chief the, the chief of the tribal their forefathers it's not he thinking of the need for education donated a huge land about 250 acres land it was an outright gift that you start school here for our children they were the first generation learners and this campus was that that area was used to build up a wonderful campus, and the next generations of that chief, they that's it's a very common uh, that you know that expectation of the humankind, that their forefathers have gifted, but they still continue to constantly linger us with small favors, asking for small favors, and if they found those favors have not been delivered. They will constantly remind us, remember, this is the land which we have donated. And I still remember a senior Swami from Belurmad was visiting and to him also he sent the same thing. The Swami very calmly told, I don't understand what type of gift it is when you go on saying that you have donated. Once you have donated, it is no more yours. It, you have given it to someone else. Then when you are saying that I am donated, still the sense of possession is there. So what type of donation it is? It's though it is not you, it's your forefathers who have donated and that also for the good of the entire society, not for you. Still you have expectation and that expectation in no way is reasonable. So what it's not that what he taught the others that I'm saying, we understood what he told from that 
a wonderful idea that once you have donated someone and now you say that I have donated, that shows though the thing is not with you, your mind is still clinging to that object. Otherwise, why do you go on saying that you have donated? Once you have given it, it is no more yours. Forget it. So that's the thing which is being indicated when we say that we shouldn't expect anything. Total. Once given, forget. So why should we expect anything in return for what we do? Be grateful to the man you help. Think of him as God. Is it not a great privilege to be allowed to worship God by helping our fellow men? If we were really unattached, we should escape all this pain of when expectation and could cheerfully do good work in the world. Is cheerfully do good work in the world. When you are doing good to the world, you will find that you feel happy. That we are built in such a way that the ego is an out of product of ignorance. When the more you become concerned about yourself, the more you will find in the more you intense is your suffering. The more you think of yourselves, the more you develop all the lifestyle diseases. You become more careworn. I still remember when our Shiva Pratishthan, the hospital uh, center which we run in Calcutta, it's a huge hospital. In its 75 years anniversary celebration, the one of the health, the health minister from the communist government came as the chief guest. Now, you know, the communists uh, as such don't have the belief in God. So they are coming to a religious organization. So then when they deliver lecture, so it's also of our interest. Then let's see what they speak coming to a religious organization and they are delivering a lecture. And he gave a wonderful lecture. There was no indication of God or religion, nothing. But what he told was something very, very interesting. Suddenly he in his speech, he told that you monks are extremely cunning. So we were taken aback that what he's going to say, you are extremely cunning. The next sentence was wonderful. That we constantly think of ourselves have developed pressure, diabetes, all these diseases in the middle age. You, in by serving others, enjoy such a blissful life. So that's the cunningness which he found in us. In us means in the so-called that all the monks who were sitting there. So in general, what a wonderful way he was saying that you lead a wonderful life. And we saw it, we, you, can, you can palpably see it. When in, in a, uh, we were in the residential school uh, looking after the students. Then during the celebration, like Guru Maharaj's birthday, Holy Mother's birthday, Swamiji's birthday, or Durga Puja, whatever may be, uh, as you know, that huge crowd comes. So we request our students to volunteer. I won't say request. It's actually a duty allocated to them. We will uh, have a list of names that such and such uh, student has to go and help in distributing the prasadam. Now, the very first reaction was the students, they were apathetic. They somehow wanted to... Uh, get rid of it, avoid it. But we were insistent, no, you have to, this is a part of your education, it is a part of your training. You have to reach out by serving others. The small work you have to do. And that's also small hours. There are other volunteers, but as we think it's something which will train you, uh, which will uh, make your character more integrated, we think it has to be done. To a certain extent, we are imposing upon you. You have to do it. So with all reluctance, with all apathy, they start. Now, as they are all small ones, they are young ones, we made it sure that they shouldn't be serving all along uh, from morning to evening. It's only one hour was allocated just to give them a taste of it. And then the volunteers, the, our other volunteers are there, sufficient volunteers are there, they come and take over the job. Very interesting, whenever, it, uh, that every year we saw that, 
that when we ask them they are reluctant but when they start now after an after one hour when the volunteers come they are not willing they won't give them they want to continue now we have to force them please stop because we know they are very tender young ones they will develop invariably develop this body pain next day because that it's a really very tedious job but they somehow insist that let them be allowed to continue such a joy they get in it and next day invariably they are going to get body pain but they are not bothered so cheerfully when you relate to the world this is a wonderful thing in this life so many things we do we plan that it will give us happiness it never gives us happiness sometimes we are forced unexpectedly we do something and we find tremendous joy because this is the way we are programmed because our real nature is non local any act which helps us to go beyond that locality to dissolve that ego by relating to others immediately it gives us joy because you are free from the disease what is disease it is the localization of your awareness that when i am diseased what happens when i am healthy i find that i am not aware of any particular part of my body the health is throbbing through your entire body through your psyche and when i am diseased what is the sign i say my head is aching i am having a headache there is a pain in my chest there is a, a sense of uh, what do you say that um, stuffiness in my chest there is a congestion there is a pain in my knee i have a stomach problem what has happened when you were healthy you were not aware of any particular part of the body it your health was life was as if throbbing through the entire body when you get diseased your awareness gets localized so our ego is actually the greatest sign of disease it gets localized just to my own psychophysical existence it just gets localized to me and mine and we never feel happy and it's a big delusion we all are going through it but we cannot come out of it but somehow if you will find that's why we used always used to say that in india that if you have to give something to some say poor person please do not give it yourself in the house if there is a small one ask the child to give it let him experience the joy if you go on giving him lecture that in giving there is happiness he will never understand it make him do it most probably you have planned to donate some uh, amount uh, for some reason instead of yourself giving it do it through your child say for the child's birthday part party say the child that instead of spending the money just with your friends why not use the money to give away i can we can give you an assurance the joy that the child will get in his birthday will be far better than just enjoying with the friends all the rich friends by having a party it will be much better because it's our psyche is designed such a way that whenever we are relating to others an inexplainable joy unexplainable joy ensues because you are relating to the others so that's what swami is saying that if we were really unattached we should escape all this pain of when expectation and could cheerfully do good work in the world this cheerful word is very important it's not that as a sense of duty i'm doing that any act of empathy gives us happiness and it's that happiness which actually almost motivates you to good to the world that's the only thing that you know that's a i i would just try to relate a story nice story it's a story of in our indian tradition the story sometimes helps to idea i understand this idea is very very clearly that you know they, that uh, the mothers mother in law can be sometimes very very exacting and strict so such a it is a story of such a mother in law that everything has to be under her command so now in uh, that she was such a very uh, what do you say that uh, authoritarian lady the wife uh, the daughter in law always used to be very sub, what is subjugative 
that she, always fearful that lest uh, mother-in-law gets angry. And now the story goes like that, that every day one beggar used to come to that house. And the mother-in-law will come out and with full authoritarian voice will say, just push off that we have nothing to give. And it was going on for days. But the beggar was also very persistent, silently every day, though it was mentioned that it was told to him that don't come, every day will come. And every day the mother-in-law will come out and shout at him. Haven't I told you not to come over here? Just go away, nothing to give. And one day the mother-in-law was for some reason not at home, went out for some work. And that's the time when the beggar came. Now he was asking for alms. So the housewife came out and from her body language, it was found that she's willing to give, but out of fear, she politely told, I have, we can give, we have nothing to give. Please uh, just forgive us. So it was a very, very humble tone. And when the wife was just asking the beggar to go away, that's the time the mother-in-law returned. And seeing that the daughter-in-law has asked, is asking the beggar to go away, the mother-in-law immediately shouted at his daughter-in-law, who are you to say? Who are you to just say the beggar to go away? So she called the beggar. The beggar was happy, at least because of this family feud, most probably I'm going to get something. Now, when the beggar turned and came and just stood in front of the door, now the mother-in-law came out and shouted, just, I have, we have nothing to give, please go away. So it is she who has to say. So that's why she has called back. So that's just, now the, everything that was, was going on was something, in the, the story goes that, that it's actually the beggar was a saint, was a very evolved saint he somehow wanted that there's some lesson should be given. That's why he was coming every day. And when this thing happened after that, he related to the, the male members, the father-in-law and the son who is to go out to work in the farm. The related said, so this is the thing which is happening. So some lessons has to be given. What the lesson, how the lesson has to be given? Now they planned. The saint told that, okay, just by giving verbal instruction, it won't help. You do one thing, you uh, just uh, purchase some fruits and keep it in your house and uh, tomorrow, please don't go for work. You just stay in your home and at the, that's the time I will come for begging. And when I come for begging, he told the son, that the saint told the son that it's you who should uh, just insist your wife to come and give us the fruits. So next day, that's the thing happened. The saint, the so-called uh, the saint in the disguise of the beggar went to beg and that day they were all home and they purchased some mangoes, it was in the basket. And now when the beggar came out to give, uh, the son sent the house, this housewife, the daughter-in-law, means his wife, to offer. But seeing that, the mother-in-law immediately came running. The same thing, that who are you to give? Now, as something has to be given, because the uh, her husband is there, her son is there, has to be given. Now, she took away the fruit from the daughter-in-law's hand. She went to offer. And now a wonderful thing happened. From the next day when the beggar again started coming, you'll find that a great change was found. The mother-in-law silently coming and is offering whatever is there to give. If the small things, whatever she can give, she is giving by herself. What has happened that though through that authority she was just took away the thing and gave, she immediately felt that inner, inner joy. And that motivated her to continue the next day, from the next day. So she was transformed. So 
after reading this story, I read it in some a moral story book long back. It was very nicely presented. And what it was written that the, the last few sentences were interesting. The take and take is terrorism. So what the terrorist, what the so-called the terrorists do, sometimes they will kidnap someone and then ask for a huge lump sum amount that give that amount, then the such and such person will be released. So take and take. First also they kidnap someone and again they are asking for money. Money. So this take and take is terrorism. Give and uh, this take and give. So this uh, you take something and give that is the government. They take the tax and they make your roads available, all the public uh, services available. So that is take and give. And give and take is business. All the business so they, they're offering us the products and we have to pay them something. So give and take, that is business. And then the last is give and receive. That's spirituality. When without any expectation you are giving, unknowingly you are receiving something. And that's the spirituality. So that's the idea when we say that cheerfully do good to the world. So never will unhappiness or misery come through work done without attachment. So this is the thing which Swamiji is stressing. Just practice it once, you will find. It is a result which, will, which you can find immediately. So you need not have to wait. Immediate result. The moment you do, immediately find it. That it is, that the result is there. The world will go on with its happiness and misery through eternity. You cannot change the world. It will go on. That Swamiji used to say that this world is like a rheumatic patient. It was like a, it is a rheumatic patient. It's pain, this, if any, your knees are paining, you massage, the knees just shift, the pain just shifts most probably to your ankle, but it never goes. So when we are trying to help the world out, you will find it just changes the nature. The misery changes the nature. We can never think of really uh, annihilating the suffering of the world. But in the process, what has happened? I have somehow attained bliss. When I've done it un without any expectation, it's not the world which is helped. It is we who are helped. So that's why the world will go on with its happiness and misery through eternity. That I cannot change. But by trying to help others, it is I who am helped. It is I who experience that ineffable joy, which nothing in this world can give us. When only the selfless act of uh, give, of service, that alone can give us the real happiness. So after this, this Swamiji will enter into the, the story. Just to explain this idea, just to uh, elaborate this idea, this world doesn't change in any way. It is we who transform. It is we who change in our attempt to change the world. So let us go through the story and uh, then uh, we will try to just highlight the idea which comes out of it. There was a poor man who wanted some money and somehow he had heard that if he could get hold of a ghost, he might command him to bring money or anything else he liked. So he was very anxious to get hold of a ghost. He went about searching for a man who would give him a ghost. And at last he found a sage with great powers and besought his help. The sage asked him what he would do with a ghost. I want a ghost to work for me. Teach me how to get hold of one, sir. I desire it very much, replied the man. But the sage said, don't disturb yourself, go home. The next day, the man went again to the sage and began to weep and pray. Give me a ghost. I must have a ghost, sir, to help me out. At last, the sage was disgusted and said, take this charm, repeat this magic word, and a ghost will come. And whatever you say to him, he will do. But we were. They are terrible beings and must be kept continually busy. If you fail to give him work, he will take your life. The man replied, 
that's easy. I can give him work for all his life. Then he went to a forest and after long repetition of the magic word, a huge ghost appeared before him and said, I'm a ghost. I've been conquered by your magic, but you must keep me constantly employed. The moment you fail to give me work, I will kill you. The man said, build me a palace. And the ghost said, it's done. The palace is built. Bring me money, said the man. Here is your money, said the ghost. Cut the forest down and build a city in its place. That's done, said the ghost. Anything more? Now the man began to be frightened and thought he could give him nothing more to do. He did everything in a trice, the ghost said. Give me something to do or I will eat you up. The poor man could find no further occupation for him and was frightened. So he ran and ran and at last reached the sage and said, Oh, sir, protect my life. The sage asked him what the matter was and the man replied, I have nothing to give the ghost to do. Everything I tell him to do, he does in a moment and he threatens to eat me up if I do not give him work. Just then the ghost arrived saying, I will eat you up and he would have swallowed the man. The man began to shake and beg the sage to save his life. The sage said, I will find you a way out. Look at the dog with a curly tail, draw your sword quickly and cut the tail off and give it to the ghost to straighten out. The man cut off the dog's tail and gave it to the ghost saying, straighten that out for me. The ghost took it and slowly and carefully straightened it out. But as soon as he let it go, it instantly curled up again. Once more, he laboriously straightened it out only to find it again curled up as soon as he attempted to let go of it. Again, he patiently straightened it out, but as soon as he let it go, it curled up again. So he went on for days and days until he was exhausted and said, I was never in such a trouble before in my life. I'm an old veteran ghost, but never before was I in such trouble. I will make a compromise with you, he said to the man. You let me off and I will let you keep all I have given you and will promise not to harm you. The man was much pleased and accepted the offer gladly. So this is the wonderful story. We also have related previously uh, that this is the story. Now the conclusion is very important after telling the story. What's the conclusion which comes out of it? The world is like a dog's curly tail. And people have been striving to straighten it out for hundreds of years. But when they let it go, it has curled up again. How could it be otherwise? One must first know how to work without attachment. Then one will not be a fanatic. When we know that this world is like a dog's curly tail and will never get straightened, we shall not become fanatics. If there was no fanatism, there were no fanatism in the world, it would make much more progress than it does now. It is a mistake to think that fanaticism can make for the progress of mankind. Just relate to the even present world. There are religious organizations, there are faiths who think if the entire world can be converted to our faith, it will solve the problem. Why there is all problems in the world? Because all are not believing in the way I believe. And that is the only way to give, what you say, the liberty to the mankind. So just now relate to this world. Just to give an exist, uh, here we will just say one thing. There are religions who believe that if the world can be converted into that one religion, there will be peace. But you can just see the paradox that such religion, if a nation has all adherents of that same religion, that is tremendous. If at present any violence is going on, fight is going on, is on those nations which has only one religion. What has happened, the biggest paradox when you believe that only one religion is going to solve all the problem, you forget that we are so diverse that in the entire human being, in the name of having one faith, 
you will immediately find there are thousands of sects growing within that faith. And now the sects start finding the way I interpret my prophet is correct, yours is wrong. And there is a terrible bloodshed there going on. That's the paradox. You can never make the entire mankind say that my faith is the only faith, that way I think is correct. It is going to end up in terrible bloodshed, even when the world as such officially has been converted to that one religion, it's never going to happen. But at last you will find the peace is not there. And that is the fanaticism which Swami is speaking. It's the attempt to straighten the dog's curly tail, which can never be straightened. So try to help the world, not with that idea that is going to be changed, with the idea that God has given me an opportunity by helping others to purify myself. The world is taken care of by the Lord. It is not me who have to take care of it. He is there to take care of it. Why should I be so fanatic about changing the ways of the world? Let it be as it is. If I really believe in God, let me believe in the God's providence. He is there to take care of me. Why should I feel that I have been authorized to take care of God's creation? Isn't it itself the biggest blasphemy? That is the biggest blasphemy. The biggest blasphemy is that, that the Lord has ordained me to create a heaven in earth. Who are we? Such insignificant creatures. Lord, he's the all powerful. He has the power to mend the ways of the world. We do good just that it's the way the Lord is uh, that kind of pleased with us. Why? That through that, that, that we cleanse ourselves. And the more we cleanse, it's not that the Lord as such is pleased. The more we cleanse, we find the Lord was always with us. It's the dirt which was not allowing me to commune with him. The dirt has been cleansed. I'm in eternal communion with him. So it's a way to cleanse out the dirt. So at last I should be straightened, not the tail. In the attempt of straightening the tail, who got straightened? The ghost got straightened. The ghost at last told the man, let us make a compromise. I won't harm you. I won't take away the things which I have given you. Let it they be with you. You just release me. So that's the idea of renunciation, that release me. After all this helping the world, and so-called, at last you will find, because of the Chitta Shuddhi, a sense of detachment has developed. You are no way, in any way now, uh, having any sense of expectation. A sense of fulfillment, rather a sense of fulfillment grows. That I was kept in a particular situation of, in life by the Lord. I did take care of my responsibilities in the best possible way. Now let me resign. Enough. The Lord is there to take care of his own creation in his own way. I am fulfilled. I have a satisfaction that I did my best to the best of my ability. I did it and now hands off. Now it's over. So that's the thing which Swamiji is trying to relate through this story. And then the fanatism won't grow. Otherwise, in the name of helping others, even today, the most horrible type of fantasism is going out throughout the world. So we think that whatever we do or possess is the best in the world and what we do not do or possess is of no value. So always remember the instance of the curly tail of the dog. Whenever you have a tendency to become a fanatic, you need not worry or make yourself sleepless about the world. It will go on without you. When you have avoided fanaticism, then alone will you, your, you work well. It is the level-headed man, the calm man of good judgment and cool nerves of great sympathy and love who does good work and so does good to himself. The fanatic is foolish and has no sympathy. He can never straighten the world nor himself become pure or perfect. So with this, we stop our discussion today. So it's almost over, just one more paragraph remaining. So in the next class, uh, uh, we will recapitulate the entire chapter and just read, uh, just uh, go through the last paragraph as a conclusion. But uh, next week, of course, we will be having Swami Vivekananda's birthday celebration for which you are all invited to join online. And the following week, 
we will again continue with our study of the karma yoga so with this we stop our discussion today thank you all thank you swami ji namaskar namaskar pranam swami ji namaskar